So my name is Darren Hess. I'm with Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. I'm the Assistant General Manager over operations for the district. And so we'll talk about uh, first a little bit about Weber Basin and what, uh, what our service area is and, and what we do. So if we can bring the slides up, that would be great. Okay, perfect. So uh, next slide, that's just our opening slide there. So that's our Weber Basin service area there. Uh, we're in Northern Utah, north of uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Davis Weber, Summit Morgan, and part of Box Elder County are the counties that uh, we service. And uh, those are our service boundaries. Next. Okay, and that essentially uh, shows our, our boundaries there. It shows the watershed and the, the different uh, reservoirs uh, that we manage. I realize that's really small. Uh, let's go ahead and hit the next slide and uh, we'll show kind of uh, one more. We'll show uh, different uh, parameters or characteristics of our, of our system. We have five different types of water that we deliver. So uh, drinking water is one, I mean, one of our main priorities that we deliver. We also have secondary water, or outdoor irrigation water, both on the retail and wholesale side. Um, and then we also uh, deliver uh, replacement water. And that's water that we deliver uh, on the Wasatch back. Systems that do not connect to a public water system are able to drill a well and they're able to access water uh, that way. And then we have ag, ag water that we deliver as well, a large contingency of ag uh, along the Wasatch Front. Uh, again, I mentioned five counties, 2,800 square miles, about uh, 700, 750,000 residents is who we serve water to. We have seven dams uh, that we manage and we'll talk about each of those. We have three power plants where we generate power and that helps uh, offset the power costs uh, for our customers uh, with that power generation. So it uh, makes it uh, uh, much cheaper uh, for our customer, customers. We have four water treatment plants uh, that we own and, and operate, um, 500 plus miles of pipeline. And then we have the largest contiguous secondary system as, as far as we are aware in the nation there in that uh, Weber Davis County area. So a huge uh, secondary water system where we utilize water directly out of the river and uh, deliver it uh, to our customers. That's kind of the way the original project was set up. Uh, it's largely unmetered, and, uh, but we have uh, moved uh, to meter that water uh, uh, forcefully in the last 10, 12 years. And uh, we have about half of our system metered now of our secondary system. It took, us, it took a while for technology to catch up to be able to meter that water, but currently uh, we are metering that and uh, moving things forward that way. Next, we'll just talk about uh, one more. Each one of our, just talks about each one of our reservoirs. Um, I can't see that far away, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there's Kazi. So, Kazi Reservoir, I'm gonna have to look behind me. Next, these are shows, we'll just go through our different reservoirs. There's Pine View Dam. So we own the top half or the top, oh, we own the top half or the top 60% of Pine View Reservoir is ours. Okay, next. Uh, that looks like Willard Bay. So yeah, so Willard Bay, that's our largest reservoir. It's, uh, it's the reservoir on the bottom end uh, off stream. And so that catches everything at the bottom of our system. It's great to have that facility to be able to catch everything that, uh, that we need to. Okay, next. And yes, with the Moore House, uh, 8,300 acre feet. Uh, that's on the North Slope of the Uinas. Okay, next. Uh, Rockport Reservoir. Uh, so that'll hold 60,000 acre feet, and that's really close to us here. Okay, next. And that one's Lost Creek Reservoir, uh, about 20,000 acre feet. Okay, next. And then East Canyon Reservoir, 
and we own the top half of East Canyon Reservoir. So we built uh, built the dam. The, that's our only concrete arch dam that we have on the system. And uh, so we own the top half of East Canyon Reservoir. Okay, next. So these, these are the, the water supplies that I have talked about earlier. It shows our municipal or drinking water. We serve 60 cities and districts uh, throughout our service area. We also have uh, industrial water uh, to the refineries, uh, Chevron, uh, Compass Minerals, uh, large, um, uh, you know, industrial, uh, you know, plants. So also I talked about the large pressure uh, secondary that we have along the Wasatch Front, both wholesale and retail, the five counties, and then the replacement water where individuals drill wells and they're able to extract water out of the ground. And what we do is we replace that water or we release water out of our reservoirs, kind of the big bucket theory to replace the water that they're pulling out of the ground from their wells. We release that water out of our reservoirs uh, to compensate for that. That's why we call it replacement water. We're replacing that water that they're pulling out of their wells. Okay, next. Okay, so here we're talking about uh, the master agreement and why uh, the master agreement was necessary uh, prior to uh, you know, 2010, uh, well, 2013 is when the master agreement was signed. But the, the different uh, agencies you can see are, are involved there. Um, so Park City, Mountain Regional, many of which are at this table, Summit Water, Snyderville Basin, uh, and then Saunders uh, and, and Summit County with a trilogy in there, part of Summit Water. Um, and just in 2010, there were more than 20 lawsuits uh, that uh, uh, folks were involved in up in this area. And, and many of which stem from, you know, where to bring the next water supply into the valley. And then in terms of, you know, different turf areas, who was going to pick up certain um, uh, demand centers or areas in terms of uh, demand. And so there was just a lot of uh, issues uh, up, in, up in the valley as a result of, of kind of turf wars as well. Uh, the governor and the federal delegation were involved and uh, asked uh, Weber Basin uh, to be involved and, and, and help with this issue up here. Um, tried to create a unified approach uh, for water supply in the system. Uh, we had a lot of meetings uh, with uh, different, uh, those different agencies and uh, difficult negotiations. Uh, it was not easy. I remember attending those meetings and uh, it was, there was not a lot of talking from some of the different sides up there at the time. Uh, there was a lot of hard feelings uh, amongst the agencies. And so much better now uh, than it was, was back then. Um, we also tried to establish or establish minimum flows for East Canyon Creek to uh, maintain the fishery uh, that's up there as well. I know at times, even after the master agreement, things have gotten uh, really low on East Canyon Creek, but we've had a good spirit of cooperation to try to help and mitigate or augment those flows uh, in the creek itself. And uh, all re water retailers were existing customers of Weber Basin at the time. And so uh, it, uh, it made sense to, to move this direction. So next. Okay. Um, also, we wanted to try to optimize the existing water resources uh, that were up in the valley as well as best we possibly can. And that was part of the master agreement to be able to do that. Um, so, um, Basically, any excess flows that we had, uh, you know, in the valley, we wanted to try to uh, utilize those as best as we possibly could and share those. Um, also, as we optimized the water resources, it uh, delayed the uh, importation project, the large importation project, which is really beneficial for the residents up here to not have uh, those significant costs. Um, it also established Weber Basin as the sole importer for new water into the valley. So the different agencies didn't have to, uh, you know, argue and fight over where the next supply is going to come from. That would be Weber Basin that would make that decision uh, moving forward. Um, also, 
uh, annually, uh, we have them submit what their supplies and demands are on their individual systems for 10 years. We have a running 10 year total and they're obligated uh, for five years to actually contract uh, for that water. And so it obligates them to, to contract for the water that they put in there. We call it the exhibit D because that's what it's called in the master agreement. And the agencies submit that to us on a, on a yearly basis. So, okay, next. So this is the, this is the diversion that we built uh, just upstream of, of Rockport Reservoir. Uh, we built this in about 2007. And so the water uh, that's delivered uh, up in this area, the surface water that's delivered up here is coming from this diversion just up above Rockport Reservoir. It's actually within, uh, you know, the, the uh, flood elevation of Rockport Reservoir. So it's coming out of the reservoir itself. Uh, we deliver that to a pump station. You can see in the background there with the green roof uh, that uh, pumps it to Mountain Regional's pump station, uh, which is uh, 4,000 horsepower. Uh, it's got its own substation. It uses so much power um, for Mikey Mountain Power. I'm sure they're thankful for that uh, power use. And then we pump that up to the Signal Hill treatment plant, Mountain Regional's uh, treatment plant at the top of Promontory. So um, this really augments the supplies. Both Mountain Regional and Park City have contracts from Weber Basin, and uh, we deliver, this is how we deliver water uh, up into this area, uh, the surface water that, that comes up here. So this is, this is a very um, strategic point in terms of the delivery of water up into Snyderville Basin is this diversion here. So, okay, next. It was under construction right there. It looks a little different now. Uh, so this shows uh, the pipeline coming from that uh, facility uh, there from the pump station, Mountain Regionals. This shows the pipeline that was built. Um, and that's a 24 inch pipeline that goes all the way to the top of Promontory there to uh, their Signal Hill treatment plant. So that's how water is, it comes into the basin. And then from there, it's uh, delivered to, to these individual uh, agencies. Okay, next. So this is the, the optimization plan or the interconnections uh, that we have built uh, in conjunction with the agencies here at the table. Um, this has been a work in progress uh, for the last uh, probably six, seven years or so that we've been building these. You can see there, there's the different interconnections, 1A, 1B, and 1C. Um, 1A allows Mountain Regional to supply water to Summit. Uh, and you can see where that's located on the map there on the uh, left, left side or west side there. Uh, 1B is located on Silver Summit Parkway and that allows Summit Water to deliver water to Mountain Regional. And then uh, 1C is located near Highway 248, uh, Park City's uh, Quinn's Junction treatment plant uh, there off of uh, US 40. And that allows Park City to be able to deliver water uh, to Summit Water. And, uh, and it just allows the water to be uh, moved around as necessary, both in terms of actual water deliveries and then also there in terms of an emergency, as uh, different agencies have an emergency, uh, we can fire those up, but uh, they're there and in place. And, you know, we use them, we use two of them uh, all the time right now. The one, 1B, we really haven't used to date, but it's there in an emergency if, if necessary. But we use 1A and 1C. 1A has been working for the last probably six, seven years. And 1C has been working the last two years, so. Uh, that's really huge to be able to optimize and use the water resources appropriately within the basin. Okay, next. Um, what did Weber Basin provide the parties? So we initially bonded for uh, the initial expenditures uh, up, you know, for this system. We also covered the debt service uh, for the first seven years, uh, both in interest and principal. Um, we've also paid the DNW lease reservation fees so as part of the master agreement, uh, Summit Water owns 5,000 acre feet in East Canyon Reservoir. And that water was turned over to Weber Basin and is going to be used for uh, future deliveries within Snyderville Basin. So 5,000 acre feet in East Canyon Reservoir 
uh, will be used for future deliveries here as necessary. Currently, as I mentioned, all the water is coming from the Rockport side, uh, but in the future, uh, it's possible it may come from East Canyon, or I'll talk about future projects that we'll look at building as well for that next large importation project. Um, and uh, also we're the federal nexus for BOR water supplies. So Weaver Basin project is a bureau project was built by the federal government. And, um, you know, we're tied in with uh, uh, the feds on, on everything that we do. They own, they own the dams and uh, we operate all the facilities, but they still maintain ownership of, of all the dams on the system, except for Smith and Morehouse. Uh, that's, that's owned by Weber Basin and was built in conjunction with the state. Other than that, uh, they are federal facilities. So, okay. Um, so uh, future projects, when will we build the next future project? Um, well, when all surplus in the basin is exhausted, Obviously, we have to start much sooner than that. Uh, we can't wait until you know those supplies are exhausted. To build a project of this magnitude, uh, if we started today, you're probably looking at uh, you know probably seven, eight years at least, I would guess, maybe even longer than that with maybe some environmental issues. Um, so uh, it is going to take a while to build that project. As I mentioned, the next importation project will be um, Weaver Basin's decision as to which direction we go. Uh, and we'll, we've, we've looked at all those different options extensively, um, but that will be Weaver Basin's decision. We will size it incrementally as best as we possibly can. Obviously, some components of the project um, have to be built from the outset, otherwise you, you just can't deliver water, but we'll do our best to size that incrementally so that uh, we're cognizant of the expenditures that are made uh, from, uh, from the agencies involved. Um, yeah, the costs uh, may require multiple uh, initial recipients. And so we'll just, we'll just have to see how that goes. Um, but uh, it's, it's gonna be a large dollar item to be able to, to build this project. So we're talking, this project, we're talking in the 80 to $100 million uh, price tag for this large importation project. That's why we really are trying to get as much out of the existing uh, water resources uh, within the valley as we possibly can within the basin. So before we have to spend uh, those kinds of, of funds. So, um, and again, uh, we will base that decision on engineering uh, that has been performed and then how to optimize costs the best we possibly can. Uh, for the customer agencies, for the customers in this valley and for the agencies that retail all the water as well. Okay, next. So this talks about uh, the Round Valley Reservoir Project and, and scope. Uh, you can see there a uh, large pipeline there in red um, coming from the Signal Hill uh, treatment plant. Uh, you can see where that uh, Round Valley Reservoir would be located uh, west of I-40 there. Um, you can see there's a large flow control structure uh, there as well. Um, it, is, it is very nicely suited for, uh, you know, a small dam uh, in that narrow neck there and uh, would be very well suited for a reservoir as the engineers have looked at that. Um, it would be nice to have storage up in the valley. It's, uh, as an engineer, I always feel better about having water close to where it's being delivered. And so from an engineering standpoint, um, that would be beneficial, uh, but we realize, you know, there, there definitely uh, would be some issues on putting a reservoir uh, located in that area, you know, in, in Park City. There would be a lot of folks probably not wanting that uh, located in that location. And Park City would have to be involved, obviously, um, you know, on, for this project. And uh, the cities would have to, or, I mean, the citizens would have to back this because obviously it would be impacting, you know, I know that those are popular trails up there for mountain bikes and things. And I think if that reservoir could just appear all of a sudden, uh, it would be one thing, but it's, it can't, right? And it would be, there would be a long process to get that built. But, but this is one option that we've looked at extensively and would be, a viable option if in fact the citizens wanted something like that in that area. Okay, next. 
This is the, the East Canyon Reservoir Pipeline System. So this is a lake tap out of East Canyon Reservoir. Uh, you can see the red pipeline there. That would be uh, need to be constructed still. Uh, you can see the blue pipeline is already in place and uh, was constructed by Summit Water. Uh, so that is in place already. Uh, there would be a, a large pump station intermediate as well as a pump station at uh, East Canyon. And, uh, um, you know, this would be uh, a project that would come from the other side or the other reservoir. Sometimes it might be nice to have two different straws into the valley, one out of Rockport, one out of East Canyon, in case one of the other is having an issue. Might be nice to have kind of a redundant supply, one on one side, one on the other. Um, but uh, this is definitely a project that we've studied extensively and could potentially utilize to bring uh, more water uh, into the valley. So um, that just gives you a little more parameters there. But uh, okay, uh, next. And then the, uh, the last option is the Lost Canyon Redundant Pipeline option. So as I mentioned before, the diversion we have is currently upstream of Rockport Reservoir. What this would do is this would do a lake tap uh, further towards the dam uh, into the reservoir itself. Uh, we do have times when you have a surface diversion uh, that's, uh, uh, that flows during the winter. We have a lot of issues with slush ice that form, especially when it gets below zero up in that area. Um, it can be difficult to operate that system with a ton of slush ice. And we have a building over that facility and uh, we could sell a lot of so snow cones out of that facility in the winter time if anybody wanted them with the ice that we pull out of that river. And so, so this would put a lake tap into the reservoir itself and it would be much more maintenance free, but you're talking huge costs to be able to do that. Brewer of Reclamation would be heavily involved uh, because you know we're tapping uh, the reservoir there. And so uh, that comes with a lot of cost. You can see the pipeline that would need to be constructed uh, that would basically uh, mirror uh, adjacent to the existing um, Lost Canyon pipeline and uh, would come into the system. So uh, and then it would tie into the system once it gets up into the basin. So this is another option that we've looked at extensively and, and definitely is a, would be a good project as well. So, okay, next. Okay, so that basically summarizes the master agreement, the different options that we have for water coming into the basin. Uh, what this, this here is talking about, I wanna just shift gears a little bit and talk about our drought contingency plan. Uh, everybody's aware of the drought that we're currently facing and where we're currently at. I know this is uh, difficult, a little difficult to see probably for you, but uh, what this does is summarize each one of those blue dots is essentially our storage on June 1st on our system. And what we did with our drought contingency plan is we worked with different universities throughout the state and we looked and modeled the uh, dendrochronology or tree ring studies is what we looked at extensively. And we mimicked what our uh, what the storage would be on our system based on tree ring studies back to 1400 basically and showed the different drought periods. Uh, you can see there some uh, dots there. Maybe I'll point real quick here for the 1930s. So uh, 1630s was a really dry period as well. Um, and so you can see there uh, in the Dust Bowl how dry things were. But then you can also see uh, 2022 is the current year that we're in. You can see about where that would end up. That's, uh, that's I think, showing about 320,000 acre feet in storage. Right now, we've got about 295 or so uh, total storage on the system in the Weber Basin drainage. And so uh, we might be able to get a little higher than that. April was really good to us in terms of adding snowpack uh, here for uh, the last few weeks. So it's likely we think we'll be a little higher than that. And so, but that just gives you an idea of, of where, we're, where we're currently at in terms of um, that, uh, you know, severe, we're in extreme restrictions right now. And, uh, you know, it'd be great if we could jump a category and, and bump up one more. And if Mother Nature continues to provide here, um, 
that, that's a possibility. So we'll, we'll have to see how things go. But really, we're looking at June 1st storage to, to figure that out. Okay, next slide. And then this shows uh, the drought level triggers. Uh, like I said, total storage uh, going to be in that 320,000 acre foot range. You can see there we're currently in response level five for our drought contingency plan. And that puts us in the extreme category um, between 280 and 340. And uh, the upper basin storage would be about 220,000 acre feet. And you can see right now uh, that would be in the severe or response level four. Uh, one more slide. And then when we worked on our drought contingency plan, we had a task force, uh, we had a stakeholder group, and we worked extensively with those different groups. We had environmental groups involved. We had our uh, industrial uh, group involved. And we talked about where those restrictions should land when we're in a drought. And these are essentially what the task force and the stakeholder group had agreed to when we're at different levels of storage on the system. And currently we're in response level five. That's why we have the 60% restriction on outdoor irrigation, 40% on ag, 60% on uh, drinking water that's used for outdoor irrigation. And then we have a 10% restriction on drinking water. And so those are the restrictions that, that came from our board at the end of March when we made those decisions. And we've let our agencies know up in this valley that those are the restrictions uh, moving forward. Uh, we definitely you know, wanna be careful with our water resources, use them appropriately, but not uh, make sure we have some water left over for drinking next year in case we're in a, find ourselves in a similar situation. We definitely can't sell ourselves short in terms of drinking water supplies for next year in case the drought continues. So, uh, but that's, that's currently where we're at and uh, we're hoping to make a change and move, but, but that's where we're at. So, okay, with that, that's my, that's the end of my presentation, so. Oh, he's pulling those up. Um, my name is Clint McAfee. I'm the Public Utilities Director for Park City Municipal. Um, so, yeah, it's great to see everyone here. Um, it's, we've often referred to us as the ourselves as the most complicated water system in the in the West. So, I'm going to explain what that means in five minutes here. Um, but while he's pulling that up, uh, so we uh, our service area is generally the municipal boundaries. So, um, you know, kind of bound by 248 and the, the ridge line and then the white barn on the, on the north side. Um, we provide water for, uh, you can go to the next slide. We provide water for indoor residential and commercial use, irrigation for landscaping. We provide water for two of the, all of the golf courses in town. There's two of them, the municipal course and the country club. Uh, we are the primary source, the only source for Vale resorts for their snowmaking. Uh, we provide water to Deer Valley as well. Deer Valley also receives snowmaking water from JSSD, from the Provo River drainage. Um, we ensure continuous flow to McLeod Creek, and we provide water uh, downstream in the Silver Creek area for agricultural use. Next slide, please. Okay, um, there's a different set of slides here, but we, we'll go with this. Um, so uh, we have, uh, so we, when we look at our source capability, um, we have eight total sources. So very diversified. Um, we have wells, a spring, we tap water from three mine tunnels and then the Rockport importation system that Darren just described. Um, so our, our, if you add it all up, our wells are about a third of our water supply. So we have three wells. They're all in the Park Meadows area. Um, so if you think about it, we all kind of live and play above our water supply. And that's why water uh, shed protection is so important. Um, and if you look at the, the three mine tunnels, Judge Tunnel, Spiro Tunnel, and Spir uh, 
Ontario drain that makes up about half of Park City's water supply. Um, and then a third comes from the Rockport Reservoir, that diversion Darren just described. Um, so let's see what's next here. <laughs> Uh, so the, the shot on the left, that is Quinn's water treatment plant um, that treats water diverted from the Rockport Reservoir, um, pumps it over the hill, over promontory, we receive it here and we treat it for drinking water. Um, that's a surface water source. That's a, a third of our water supply in Park City here right now. Again, when we say that, we're talking about how much water we can produce in, in the driest time of the year, which is typically August, when we have the highest demand, everybody's water and we have golf course irrigation, stream flows are low. Um, that's our reliable supply that we're, we're most interested in. Uh, the picture on the right is the portal of the Spiro Tunnel. Um, that is uh, um, about another third of our water supply. Um, so that we just rehabbed uh, the, over the last two years, the first 400 feet of that tunnel. Um, and we, we kind of redid the entrance, as you can see here, um, kind of highlighting the significance of the, the mining era. And um, my other slide presentation had a bunch, cool, some more entertaining pictures, but, um, but, it, but I'll just talk through it. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's just, we kind of tap into our mining history when we're building Three Kings water treatment plant, which is currently under construction. I think that's the next slide. You can go to the next slide. Nope. Um, <laughs> but that, uh, so we are building a Three Kings water treatment plant over on the golf course that will receive water from Spiro Tunnel, Judge Tunnel, and Theriot Springs. Um, so unlike Rockport water that's, uh, you know, got cow poop in it and whatever runs off from the highway, we're not concerned about that with the tunnels. What we're concerned about is metals. So, you know, zinc, cadmium, thallium, antimony, arsenic, lead, you know, every, pretty much everything. Um, and we are building a state-of-the-art uh, water treatment facility that will remove 100, nearly 100% 100 of all those contaminants. Um, and it'll be a very reliable supply for, for Park City. Um, so what's up on the screen now is our, our historical and projected water demand, um, oh, kind of uh, with the backdrop of our source water capability. So, um, the bottom blue jagged line is the jagged line is historical, and so the and the bottom the blue line is uh, what we treat and put into the distribution system, and then the red line is that added um, with our golf course irrigation and stream flow obligations um, added on top of that. So, a couple things to point out here. One, um, so the, the each data point here represents what the highest demand we experienced in a 24 hour period in the year. So we call that our peak day demand, you know, call it July 4th. It's not always July 4th, but it's, it's pretty close to there, right around the first part of July. Um, and so one thing to note is the last year, 2021 was, I think the second or third lowest year in the 22 data points we have up here. So demand is dropping both on an annual basis and a peak day basis. Um, the other thing I'll point out is you can see that red line goes into the vacant white space up there. So on paper, Park City was out of water before 2012. So that that's that's what led to building Rockport and getting it online. And it was kind of just in time. And that top band, that light blue line, is is the supply that we received from Rockport Reservoir. Um, and then kind of projecting forward, um, you know, again, speaking just for Park City, the sources we have are uh, projected to meet demands well into the future. Um, and that's with a fairly conservative growth rate. As you can see, the trend is really pointing down in demand, historical demand. Um, and we've got it pointing up and we're still able to meet it. The green kind of peak on the very top, that represents the surplus water that Park City is selling Weber Basin um, under the master agreement. And then Weber Basin then leases it to Summit Water to use in the basin. And we pump it through the interconnects that Darren talked about. So we treat it right here at Quinn's and then it's, it's kind of pumped right around this hospital 
and out into the basin right above Round Valley. There's a tank that sits right above Round Valley. Next. So there's the Three Kings water treatment plant, as I mentioned. Um, we, this is a $75 million facility, just, just the building itself. Um, doesn't include all the piping and you know, all the, the other projects that we had to complete this. Um, but yeah, we're, we're scheduled to start this up as early as late this year and, and begin making drinking water next year. Um, and again, this, this will treat water draining from the Judge Tunnel, Spiro Tunnel, and Theriot Spring. Um, to remove metals, and it'll be uh, one of our most, it'll be the most reliable source we have in Park City, um, both from a water quality and a source water standpoint. Next. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jason Christensen. I'm the water resources manager for Park City, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our conservation program our drought response in 2021 and our drought outlook in 2022. Uh, so we just wanted to highlight first off three of our most impactful water conservation programs. Uh, the first program is our tiered rate structure. Uh, the more you use in Park City, the more you pay per unit of water. So for our single family residential account class, the lowest tier is about $5 per thousand gallons. And then the highest tier is $30 per thousand gallons. Um, so there's a, an, a financial incentive that we attach to conservation. Our next tool is our WaterSmart customer portal and mailer. Uh, so Park City is fortunate the community invested in metering for the city. And that metering includes hourly read data for all of our customers. So that read data is, uh, is collected by the utility and then shared with our customer through these portal or through this portal. Uh, the portal allows a customer to uh, see their hour by hour water use. They can see how much an irrigation cycle takes. They can associate that with the cost. Um, there's also some other things that customers can, can opt into. Uh, they can set water conservation goals and then the system will send them text messages or emails to help them uh, determine if they're on track for that goal or if adjustments are needed. There's kind of a water out of office feature where you can tell us I'm gonna be out of town for a month. We don't expect to use any water. And if the system sees any water conservation or water consumption during that period, it's gonna shoot you a text, an email or a voice message depending on your preference. Uh, we also send out a mailer based on that data. So we aggregate all that data together and we group people with similar homes, similar occupancy and similar yard size together. Uh, and then we compare those people. And so we send out a mailer that'll say, you know, compared to similarly situated people, people you're using more water, you're using less water, or you're about the same. Uh, the third thing I wanted to touch on is just uh, water sense irrigation controllers. Um, it's something we recommend to all of our customers. It's kind of the low hanging fruit for outdoor irrigation and potentially reducing water use there. Uh, it's a controller that connects to the internet and makes adjustments to your irrigation cycle based on the weather in Park City. Uh, and there's a great rebate available for that through utahwatersavers.com. Next slide, please. So that's part of a holistic water conservation program. We didn't touch on everything today. Uh, along with some of our partners, we'll be distributing rain barrels this coming Sunday out at Quinn's Junction. Uh, we also encourage uh, our customers to attend classes and educational events that are put on by our partner, Weber Basin. Next slide, please. Um, one of the other things uh, we do as well as uh, focus on water loss, uh, not up on the slide right now, uh, but water loss is really an opportunity for the utility to talk the talk. Uh, so water loss is the difference between what we put into our system and what we bill out of our system. That's been a focus for us over the last couple of years. We've seen some great results from that. Uh, and we've got some excellent pictures of really spray leaks that we found. Uh, feel free to email me, the, email me if you'd like to see those at some point. Uh, so for our 2022 drought response, um, we're going to be requesting that where possible, the community limit their irrigation to two days a week. Um, by ordinance, irrigation in Park City can occur no more frequently than every other day. 
Uh, we're also going to lead by example with city facilities. Uh, so there will be uh, brown patches on the municipal golf course and uh, and different city maintained grass. It, it's not because our team doesn't want to keep that green. It's because they recognize the severity of the drought that we're in. And then we're going to enhance our level of communication. You're going to see if you're in town more communication from Park City that'll occur on social media, that'll occur in billing inserts, that'll occur in those home water reports that we talked about earlier. Next slide. Uh, so just a little performance information, uh, 2021 drought. Park City also has a drought ordinance that's based on the ratio of demand to available supply. Um, our messaging in 2022 is gonna be very similar to the messaging that occurred in 2021. Uh, based on that messaging as Clint, mess or as Clint mentioned, we saw a meaningful reduction in our peak day demand. The highest ratio we saw was 70%. Higher ratios trigger uh, mandatory reductions in outdoor irrigation up to and including no outdoor irrigation allowed. Next slide. Uh, these are just some of the performance metrics, some of the response that we saw. We saw meaningful reduction uh, both on city irrigated property from the community with any build irrigation accounts. Uh, and we're just, I guess, proud of the response from last year, and we hope that that continues into 2022. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Lisa Hoffman, Assistant General Manager at Mountain Regional Water. And while we bring up those slides, uh, we have a new general manager. It just started last week, I guess. He has one week under his belt, Andy Garland. Some of you may love and recognize him. He spent some time at Summit Water. So we're happy to have him on board. And Andy's gonna jump in and help me as I walk through these slides. Just really quickly, Mountain Regional, just a little history, was formed in 2000. Uh, the Summit County Commission, now the County Council, formulated uh, Mountain Regional Water. And that really was to help stabilize the water delivery in the Snyderville Basin due to some failing water systems and um, trouble with delivery. So Mountain Regional, the county uh, established Mountain Regional, could come in, stabilize that, and uh, provide water service to the basin area. Next slide. The service area is in the pink color there. You can see it's a little bit of a smattering um, all over the basin area. That top left corner there is Summit Park. We serve up there. The bottom of, this, bottom of the slide would be the colony. So we go all the way to the south end of the basin with the colony. And then the far right side would be promontory. And then the, the top um, portion of the slide would be um, Glen Wild Preserve heading out to Stagecoach area. So we have about a 40 square mile um, service area, which is quite large. Um, in that service area, we also have uh, quite a bit of elevation change from our 6,000 feet elevation at Rockport, where Darren talked about we take delivery from surface water there, all the way up to the top of Colony, which could be at 9,300 feet. So it's a uh, pretty large and expansive. We have 39 pressure zones and we have 140 pumps in 44 pretty remote areas. So you can imagine our operators, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the staff later, but we have a quite a bit of area and ground to cover. Um, some of our system metrics here, we are approaching 5,000 rooftops. So um, we have about 1,450 standby customers and a standby customer is a customer who um, is ready to be connected, but is not using water yet. So they may be in the process of building or maybe a future development coming on. Um, but we about 1,450 there. We talked about the 40 square miles. Um, like Park City, we also saw a drop in our peak day delivery. Um, we did 6 million gallons on our peak day last year. And we also deliver 6,000 acre feet annually. In 2020 and 2021, we were about six, just over 6,000 acre feet. I'll show you a slide on that next. Um, we are very interconnected, like Weber Basin discussed. Being part of this interconnected, uh, kind of our original mission of Mountain Regional Water was to interconnect those systems. We have quite a bit of interconnectivity and we have those emergency connections Darren talked about with the other water agencies in the area. 
Um, our sources are different. We don't have mine tunnel water. We do get about 50% of our source from the surface water from Weber Basin, and then another 50% or so from our ground wells. And we do have some of those replacement contracts that Derek or Darren mentioned. Um, so we're, we're fairly tied to Weber Basin uh, as far as our water service contracts go. Uh, we do have one spring that we share in with Summit, with Summit Water that um, also adds to that water source. Okay, next slide. So that 6,000 acre feet that I talked about, uh, that bottom color there, that reddish color, uh, that's our culinary deliveries per acre foot. And that was just over 2,000 acre feet last year. That blue line is our um, delivery, our secondary irrigation. That's the only secondary or raw water irrigation that we have. And that's to promontory for their golf courses and some other irrigation needs. Uh, the green uh, bar there is our deliveries through that Lost Canyon system, Darren mentioned, up over to Park City. And then that top purple portion is our delivery to Summit Water through the wholesale uh, master agreement that Darren talked about. So Mountain Regional has had some surplus capacity over the last is six to seven years now. And we've been contracting through Weber Basin to deliver water to Summit Water. Next slide. This is a little bit of a busy slide, my apologies, but this is very similar to the slide that, um, that, uh, that um, Clint talked about. This is our supply demand model. It's very similar. That red dashed line at the top shows our peak day source capacity. So this is basically where our peak, our peak day sources are. And then the little dashed line below, I know it's hard to see, I'm sorry, but the line below that kind of is where our peak day demand is. You can see there's a bit of a difference between the two. That would be our, our cushion in case we were to lose a source. We wanna make sure we have redundancy in the system. So if something goes down, we can still re provide reliable service to our customers. Um, so we, we, then this is how we do all of our forecasting. So we too have kind of a demand curve that's, that's gradually going up. We've seen obviously some significant growth in the last year, but we've known that was coming. Um, so we continue to update those forecasts and projections going forward. If you, if you were looking at, you know, when those, when that next capital project might happen, we're kind of looking at where that green line might intersect with that yellow and gray line. And right now that's out at about 2040. So we have enough source capacity in the projects that we currently have um, in the works to develop to help meet the demands of our customers. Next slide. Um, some of the capital facility plans we have, uh, we're currently discussing is the potential expansion of our Signal Hill treatment plant, that treatment plant at the top of Promontory, uh, where we boost up um, from Lost Canyon and that Rockport side. It's currently at 3 MGD with the potential to go to 6 MGD. We're evaluating that right now with our engineering partner, Jacobs. Uh, we're also potentially looking at um, some more groundwater development or new well in the basin area. And we're currently working on internally several pump station upgrades to help move the water around the district. Next slide. Just a quick, who is Mountain Regional? Who are we? We're a pretty small staff. We have 28 people, um, but we do have a combined experience of over 250 years in the water uh, industry. We have a licensed civil engineer, a licensed surveyor. We have a licensed contractor. I'm a certified public accountant. Uh, we have an MBA. Um, so quite a, quite a big breadth and depth of staff um, that we rely on heavily to, um, for our day-to-day -day operations. Next slide. Uh, like Park City, we wanted to kind of mention our conservation initiatives. We, um, over the last three to five years have been very focused on our water loss monitoring. And there's kind of two pieces to that. We have one that is our district water loss, what Jason spoke to a little bit, where in our system are we not being efficient? Where are we getting some loss? And so um, we have been able to, with technology and really um, mapping out our tank sources and looking at our our tank sources coming in and where the demand is going out through our smart meters really identify where we're getting lost in the system. And right now we're sitting at about 14 to 17% water loss. And our goal is to reduce that to 10% by 2026. It's a pretty lofty goal. We've been working really hard. Like I said, we found some really, um, we had some really big gains in the last two years. So we're gonna continue to work there. 
Um, the second part of that, and Jason spoke to this, is our metering system. We've undergone a five-year uh, change out of our meters. So we've gone to these smart meters that give you down uh, readings down to 15 minute increments. So on a 24 hour basis that updates and you're able to see and compare your daily usage, your weekly usage, year over year usage. Uh, it also provides a leak alert, very similar technology to what Jason already talked about. And all of our customers are metered. Um, the second one, uh, like Park City, conservation rates have been instituted at Mountain Regional for some time now. Um, the more you use, the more you're going to pay. Um, we have really seen a reduction from that tiered rate so that um, it, it is really an incentive to use less water. And by continuing that reduction, we think in the future with um, some of the, the, obviously the drought situation that we're in, um, it also can help change the timing of capital projects. So if we're not needing to bring capital projects on as soon or as quickly or as large, um, it just helps reduce costs to our customers. Uh, the other thing that I, um, I think the district is very proud about, I'm very proud about, is we don't only talk about water conservation, but we all, always talk about energy conservation. It takes a lot of energy to move that water around from 6,000 feet of elevation to 9,000 feet of elevation. So Mountain Regional has always used a very unified strategy when we're talking about conservation, not only water, but also energy. Um, we are analyzing pumping curves to always make sure we're pumping at the right rates. We are always pumping off peak when we can to make sure we're taking advantage of, of good power rates. Uh, we're also currently in the process of doing an RFP for a floating solar array on top of our pond at the treatment plant. And that would power our entire treatment plant, um, which is a huge benefit, uh, as well as keep the algae down in our plant or in our, on our plant, in the pond, and also um, help with evaporation. So we think that would be a huge benefit. Um, we're getting the RF out, RFP out right now. Um, it would be the first one in Utah that I'm aware of. We've seen one in Colorado and they seem to be working really well. Um, we're also a partner in the counties and Park City's uh, solar array farm out in Tooele. So we've, we've joined in that effort as well. Next slide. Uh, we also have a drought response plan, which we adopted in 2021, following Weber Basin's release of their drought response plan. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, fairly tied to Weber Basin because of our surface water and replacement contracts with them. So our triggers are a Weber Basin reduction. If we, if we get reductions from them, then we, that would trigger us to look at our uh, drought response plan. We could also have unsustainable groundwater recharge. If we're not seeing our groundwater sources recharging, then that could also trigger it, um, or a declared state of emergency in the basin area. Uh, we have six drought response levels. Darren showed them earlier. Ours very much mirror that of Weber Basins, the six levels. Last year, as part of our budget cycle, we also in anticipation of potentially having restrictions this year due to the persisting drought, we adopted a drought reserve fund of $800,000. So in the event that we needed to um, have drought restrictions and that would obviously lead to a revenue shortfall. So we didn't want our customers to have to bear the full burden of that. So we established this drought fund to help us weather, um, weather that storm. Next slide. So um, in 2022, we did end up with drought restrictions. As Darren has mentioned, uh, we, um, our board discussed uh, what those drought restrictions would look like uh, for our customers at our last board meeting in um, the end of April. And we're following a, similarly to what Darren's um, asking for, a 10% reduction in indoor usage by our customers. We're asking for a delay of outdoor irrigation until June 1st. Um, I think Weaver Basin is saying May 15th. So we're just extending that a couple more weeks if people can. And with this cool weather pattern we've been in and, and the temperatures and the, the um, precipitation we've seen, I'm hopeful that we can continue um, to have that June 1st target date. Uh, twice a week watering like Park City, before uh, Mountain Regional had been on the every other day, but if we can cut that back to twice a week, that would be a 33% savings right there already. So really twice a week would be the optimal um, 
conservation message that we're, we're having right now. And really, we also wanted to shorten that window of when you're irrigating. So making sure that you're irrigating between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. when you can get the most absorption of that water into your landscaping. A lot of times people ask us, what does the watering look like? So I, uh, Weber Basin has put out some information on, you know, 20 minute for a pop-up spray, 40 minute for a rotary spray, and 60 minute for a drip line. Next slide. And then I just had a few resources here. These slides will be available later. Um, our website has great resources on, on, on information on conservation tips, indoor and outdoor. outdoor. Um, slowtheflow.org, you may have seen, there's lots of um, media and press around that. Uh, water.utah.gov is a great site um, for continued resources on, on water in the state. Utah Water Savers has all the rebates Jason mentioned for those smart controllers. There are toilet rebates. Um, there's a flip your strip program that Weber Basin part participates in. So quite a lot of information there. And localscapes.com is also a great place to get information if you're thinking about making some changes to your landscaping. So I'm Mike Folkman. I'm the Assistant General Manager at Summer Water. This is Del Chini. He's our uh, General Manager. And whenever you're ready. All right, next. Maybe. So this is our service area in the light blue. You can see um, we service various residential and commercial uh, customers throughout the Snyderville Basin. Our service area ranges from Jeremy Ranch at the top to Quinn's Junction Film Studio, bottom right, and the Canyon Ski Resort on the left. Um, we service snowmaking to the canyons, the sports park, uh, Shellside Park, et cetera. Um, for as far as our water sources, we get our water from nine wells in the spring as well as, oh, next slide, sorry. We get our water from nine wells in a spring um, that we share with Mountain Regional. And we also purchase 1,150 acre feet from Weaver Basin. Um, this water gives us a combined total of 5,400 gallons per minute available for peak day demand. Next. As far as our future water, our future water is all coming from Weaver Basin. Um, as you can kind of see, I can't remember the colors, but the yellow is our demand, the greens are supply, and the, the blue is just growth. Um, but as you can see, our demand is kind of always ahead of our, or always a little bit behind our. How's that? Does that work? All right, so we always try to get a little bit ahead in pr our predictions. So we have a little bit of a buffer in case we lose a well or a source. Um, we plan on bringing in 200 acre feet in 2025, another 200 in 2026. Um, and then we probably bringing on another 300 by the year 2030, which would give us a combined total of 870 gallons a minute for future growth, at least to get us to 2032-ish. As far as our top three conservation plans, um, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse to go last because these guys all stole my thunder. Um, we too have the smart meeting technology, smart meters. Um, we've switched everything over. Uh, we've been super impressed. In fact, next slide, if you could. In this chart right here, this customers, we saved them 9,000 gallons a day because we found a leak in their uh, water feature out in the front yard. Um, so it's a really useful tool. We, our, our staff uses it to help troubleshoot leaks, notify people if there's issues with their water. I won't go a lot into that, but it saved us hundreds of thousands of gallons a year. Um, we also see, uh, next slide. We also see, uh, 
reducing water loss through identifying and repairing un underground leaks is a major important part of our conservation program. We have trained staff and specialized equi equipment that go out and it actually listens for the leak and lets us know where it is. And we, we go through the system systematically street by street and just try to find these leaks. Um, and our goal over the next five years, three and a half years, is to uh, reduce our water loss by 10%, which is for us is like drilling another well. So very, very cost effective for us. Um, our third one is just education. And we actively promote conservation from our website, social media, mailers, and any contact we have with customers. And then we've also found out that a lot of our customers use uh, landscape contractors to set their timers and they really don't even know when they're going. Um, so we've reached out to some landscapers and kind of informed them of how much water our customers have available, um, what our watering schedule looks like and, and anything they might need to help them. Uh, next. As far as responding to the drought, last year we implemented a twice week watering schedule with no watering on Sundays. And the Sundays gave our sources a chance to really rest and get ready for the next week. Um, we saved 20% over water use over that season, which really helped us a lot. Our sources are, are looking pretty good, to be honest with you. Um, next year, we plan on continuing the same thing. We're just gonna twice week watering, Sundays off. If uh, we need to, we could go to once a week. I don't think it would be necessary and we're going to kind of watch a little closer to the people that are abusing. There's those people that always break the rules. And so we're going to be a little more, more tough with those guys. And that's a bit it, about it. We, we want to thank our customers, though, because they really did stand up and do a great job and just cut, cut our water use way down. So thanks. Uh, good evening. Good evening. My name is Mike Lures. I'm the general manager of the Water Reclamation District. As you've heard tonight, there are three major water providers in the Park City Snyderville Basin area, with Weber Basin providing additional water. Uh, when it comes to wastewater or sewer service, there's only one of us. Uh, next slide, please. So, who are we? We are a special district, much like the uh, fire district or rec district. Our sole purpose in life is to protect human health and protect the environment by collecting wastewater and treating it and then discharging it in, back into our local streams. Uh, we are governed by a board of uh, trustees who are elected by you. Next slide. You may have seen this flyer in your bill recently. Uh, we are trying to educate uh, our customers who we are. We took a survey last year and about 25% of our customers think that we provide water. We do not. We collect what you flush. Go ahead, next slide. So since we are the only wastewater provider for the Park City Snyderville Basin area, we cover all of those areas that you've heard previously being covered uh, by the various water companies. Everything from Primatory to Summit Park to Deer Valley. Uh, we have over, six, uh, over 300 miles of pipeline, about a 10 pump stations, 7,000 manholes, and uh, our collections department collects all the wastewater and then sends it to two uh, treatment facilities, one located at Jeremy Ranch and the other kind of back behind Home Depot. And uh, on the screen here is a representation of the entire Park City Snyderville Basin area that we provide service to. Okay, next slide. So this is our Silver Creek facility, which we rebuilt two years ago and we increased the level of treatment to tertiary or advanced treatment so that we are now removing uh, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen and those type of things to protect not only Silver Creek that we discharge into, but also uh, it flows all the way down into uh, Echo Reservoir. Next slide. Our East Canyon facility located in Jeremy Ranch uh, currently discharges into East Canyon Creek, which you see in the foreground. 
this facility serves approximately two thirds of our service area. So if you're in the Park City area, it basically serves everything west of Main Street, all the way down uh, through the Snyderville Basin area, including Summit Park. And uh, uh, it's located back uh, behind uh, uh, our main offices uh, in that area. Next slide. So East Canyon Creek, I wanna talk a little bit about because it's, it's a thing that, it, it's a situation that has developed over the last 30 years. East Canyon Creek was a blue ribbon trout fishery at one time. Uh, it contains uh, some of the native Bonneville cutthroat trout. And uh, it was at one time a beautiful stream and it still is a beautiful stream, but it does have some problems uh, that we all need to be aware of. Next slide. Because we all moved here, we use the water from the wells and the mine shafts and uh, you know the springs and East Canyon Creek can dry up at times. This is a picture from a number of years ago when uh, we had a large fish kill and it's because the people that own the water rights exercise their legal right to use that water and there was nothing left. East Canyon Creek, as I say, does not have a protected base flow. So that if you have the water rights and you exercise those rights, the fish will die. Uh, and it's because uh, we all moved here and we need that water for culinary purposes. Now, as uh, Darren from Weber Basin mentioned, the master agreement addresses this. And we've had a rough time the last couple of years because we've had a drought. But I'll have to give kudos to the uh, water companies who are sitting to my right here because when we get down to these critical low levels, uh, everyone has really stepped up and uh, we've avoided some major fish kills. Next slide. This is what happens when the, we don't work together. And this happened many, many years ago. We've avoided that problem uh, because uh, when we talk to the water companies, uh, even some of the uh, golf courses, and we say, hey, we're at a critical stage. We need a few extra gallons of water to help protect the fish. Everybody has stepped up and, and helped out. You know, what's going to happen in the future, we don't know because, as we all know, the, uh, the drought conditions, climate change, whatever, uh, you, any way you look at it, uh, there's less water in our local streams. Next slide. So because of these low stream flows and because of all the pharmaceuticals that our customers take, we have had a problem uh, with the cocktail of drugs coming down the pipeline. Even though we have advanced treatment, our treatment plants were never designed to remove pharmaceuticals, nor are we required to even study them, uh, much less remove them. Uh, next slide. Since our treatment plants do not remove a significant portion of the pharmaceuticals, they end up in our local creek. We've been researching the impact of these uh, pharmaceuticals for some time now, and uh, I, I can talk to you more about that uh, if you want to know about uh, the, the research that we've been conducting. Next slide. One of the things we have done though, is we've gone out and we've sampled the blood of the fish that live downstream of the treatment plants. And uh, we can tell you what levels of uh, pharmaceuticals are in their blood and in, in the flesh and give you some idea of the impact of the pharmaceuticals. Uh, the biggest concern we have right now are the estrogens and uh, they potentially can turn a male fish into a female, but uh, we have not gone, uh, we have not seen that happen, but we do anticipate that in the future, as the amount of wastewater that we treat continues to increase, that we'll have to treat uh, for the pharmaceuticals and uh, that'll cost uh, you know, a significant amount of money. Next slide. Another thing that we're researching are microplastics. Wastewater is a major source of microplastics to the environment. About a third of the microplastics in the ocean come from wastewater. And that is because we all wash our synthetic clothing and that ends up in the wastewater. A typical load of laundry contains about 700,000 microplastic particles. Next slide. So we're a basic uh, service provider. We do not control growth. We respond to growth as it's approved. And uh, it's our job to keep up with that. Sometimes we have to expand our treatment facilities to, uh, to meet that need. Uh, next slide. So we have a project underway to expand the Jeremy Ranch facility. 
Uh, this is a $110 million project. This does not include increasing or improving the level of treatment. We've already done that. This is strictly adding capacity for new growth. And uh, the good news is that that will be paid for by the developers and, and not by current customers. But these types of projects are very expensive. It takes us about six years. We're into it about two years right now, and it will be under construction uh, next spring. Next slide. Let's talk about reuse, water reuse. So water reuse is when you take treated wastewater like we produce and you use it for irrigation, snow making, or even potentially drinking water. In the state of Utah, we do not have any legal right to use the water that we treat. That legal right is held by the water company that has the appropriate water rights and they hold that right until we are through treating it and it is released back into the environment. So we frequently get questions as to, hey guys, why don't you use your treated wastewater to make snow, irrigation for golf courses and all. And the bottom line is that that's not up to us to decide that. That's up to the water companies to decide that. And we are talking to a couple of water companies that are looking into reusing water, but reuse in the state of Utah is controlled by the underlying water right holders and not the wastewater uh, provider. Next slide. So I invite you to take a tour of the wastewater treatment facilities. I'll be happy to give you uh, a presentation on the pharmaceuticals, microplastics, and all those types of things that we uh, are, are dealing with. And we certainly appreciate all of you attending this evening. Thank you. Okay, as if that one wasn't awkward enough, this one gets really awkward. So um, I'll start over. So we are operating on a hybrid model. We will be alternating back and forth between questions online being monitored by Gretchen and the questions of those in the room here. If you are online and you have a question, we ask that you use the Q&A function so that we can take those questions. I will read the question to the group and then uh, assign that to the appropriate water agency. If you're in person, I ask that when you come to the microphone, you state your name and uh, address, if you have a specific question, address it to that water company. If it's a general question, uh, I will take the question and then assign it as appropriate. And uh, lastly, I ask that you be courteous at the microphone. There are a lot of people that are attending both online and in person. So please make your questions concise. If it is a question that can be addressed offline with that individual, uh, and it gets to a point where it might be best suited to continue that conversation offline. Uh, we might ask you to hold the rest of your thoughts and then address one of the water purveyors after the meeting so that we can make sure we get through everybody's questions. So with that, I think we will start in the room. The microphone is centered. Again, state your name and uh, go from there. So yeah, I think go ahead and jump up.
So I'm Del Cheney. Um, thanks for your thanks for your question. Our our system's kind of unique in the sense that you're a shareholder, and all shareholders are treated the same based on the share that they hold. So you're allowed so much water per your share, whether it's a half acre, three quarters, full acre, whatever it is. And so a few years ago, they they implemented because of people like yourself that that tried to conserve. Um, so what they did was they they figured out they did a rate study. And the race study showed what it would cost to operate the water system. And they implemented a pump surcharge, which, which actually was, was the cost of the water that you used. So people that conserved seen a, seen a break in their costs. The people who didn't conserve seen an a, a increase in their costs by that pump surcharge. So because of the way it's, it's the bylaws of the company and the structure, it's, it's hard to just give anybody or, or make certain uh, changes without uh, board approval and or um, a vote. I understand all of this and um, my objection or it's not really an objection. I'm not saying that we should get a lower rate because we're using less water. Sure. That's understood. Sure. We knew it when we bought. Sure. What I am saying is I think there should be some incentive for people to change from having grass to xeriscaping and any other things that they are doing, particularly to save water. And that's why I'm, I'm addressing all of you, because it's not just summit. Sure. It's, it's that I feel there should be incentives for people to really do the right thing. Besides saying just water twice a week, make it so if you're willing to put out expense to that you're not going to water at all, or you're going to go to a drip system that just has a few shrubs, that you encourage people to make this investment in all of our future. Yeah, and that's a good question for every for everybody, for sure. Okay, while well, Brian works on the microphone here, we do have a question from the online chat and it comes from Bill and it says, is the basin concerned about the low level of echo reservoir seeing that the basin gets a bunch of its water from that area? Darren, do you wanna take that one? I have issues with my mic. Oh, it's on? Okay. So, um, yeah. I tried to listen to the question when I was fighting with my mic, but uh, Echo Reservoir. So, uh, you know, the uh, basin really does not pr get water from Echo Reservoir. It's really Rockport Reservoir is where the water is coming from. That's where the diversion is just upstream. So Echo Reservoir is uh, a reservoir. It's the earliest on the system. Uh, built essentially in the 1930s. It predated uh, the Weaver Basin Project. And so essentially that's a, a Weaver River water users facility. Um, it's mainly for ag use because uh, that's what it was built for originally. Uh, Weaver Basin does own shares uh, in Weaver River water users. And so we own about 6,000 shares in that company. And then we have another 5,000 acre feet that we own in Echo. Uh, but again, that's the early water right, right holders have that reservoir. You know, it's it's a rarity when that reservoir does not fill. Uh, we did not fill it last year uh, because they have the early water right. Uh, this year, it's going to be nip and tuck. Whether it fills or not, we think it will. But if that reservoir does not fill, then Weber Basin essentially does not store any water on the system because we are the junior water right holder on the system. And so Rockport, uh, you know, is secondary in terms of water right. Well, third. Provo River Water Users actually owns the, the second water right on the system. And then, and then Weber Basin would be third after that. So, um, you know, that's just, that's the way water rights work. Uh, first in time, first in right. And uh, Weber Basin was not first in time. And so, yes. And so we do, we operate those reservoirs uh, in conjunction with each other, both Rockport and Echo. And so we do have water in Rockport Reservoir because Weber Basin has carryover storage uh, from last year. 
Also, we recently purchased water from the Provo side, water that would normally go over the Weber Provo diversion. Uh, Weber Basin uh, purchased water from Central Utah. Uh, that's up to 19,000 acre feet now that we've purchased from that side that holds water on the Weber side. It's the first agreement of its kind that we've been able to work with all the entities on the Provo side and get water to stay on this side. And so none too soon in terms of the drought. We were able to, we've been working on that the last year and have been fortunate to have uh, water companies work with us and, and help us out in that regard. And so now we are paying a lot of money for that water that we're keeping on the Weber side. It's, it's extremely expensive, but we feel like it's in the best interest of the Weber side to keep that water, so. Okay, thank you. All right, it's, yeah, let's jump in into the group here. Please remember to state your name. Go ahead. Yep. Hi, I'm Barbara, and I just wondered from everyone, like a lot of the water comes from wells. Are we worried? Do, are you seeing groundwater levels change? What's the recharge of groundwater? Since a lot of it's surface, but kind of what's happening in general there. That's so I've been asked to restate the question for those that are on Zoom. So. Um, no, I, I'll, because I'm not sure which microphones are working and which ones aren't. So the question, uh, the essence of the question was, are we concerned about potential water levels dropping in water sources in Snyderville Basin? And what does the, the history tell us about that? So I don't know, do we want to, Clint, are you okay to take that sure. one to start and maybe pass yeah, it to so, Mountain Regional? Sure. So yeah, we, uh, just a reminder, we get um, about, uh, well, I can't remember the percentages, but we have three wells in Park City and two mine tunnels, which are basically horizontal wells. Um, and we are not seeing any reductions in, in groundwater. Um, and we, we just did a, a source water protection, or sorry, groundwater protection plan update. And we had our hydrogeologists kind of, you know, look at the aquifer for that exact, you know, I'm, I'm like, is there some water level that we can't see and all of a sudden it's just going to run out and it's too late, you know, at, when we see it, it's too late. And he, um, you know, just based on the local geology is, is not concerned about that. We're not seeing it in the data. We're not seeing any major reductions, unusual reductions in the tunnel flows. Um, you know, those are directly correlated to, to snowpack, how much water we get out of there. So, so yeah. And I'll just, to, you know, echo, we don't get water from the local reservoirs, but when I see them, I think it's just a reminder that, you know, there's a strong likelihood that we will see less water in the future, less snowpack. And I know everyone at this table is thinking about that constantly. Um, you know, sometimes at two in the morning <laughs> on August, you know, a hot summer night or something is usually when it happens. But no, I mean, constantly we're, we're thinking about it. And I, you know, I think we're always looking at ways to, you know, uh, conserve water, decrease demand, um, you know, de decrease landscaping, um, decrease the, the amount of leaks we're seeing in our system. Um, so while not, we're not directly connected to ECHO um, or any of the major reservoirs you see, you know, we drive by them and, it, and it's a constant reminder that, you know, we need to keep up um, with our demand reduction programs as, snowpack can potentially and likely decreases over time. I'd echo similar to what Clint said. We, um, while we have seen some decreases in our, in our well production, it hasn't been significant. We've continued to monitor it very closely. We actually have hired a hydrogeologist and we're doing a whole groundwater management plan this year so that we study all of our sources. We're making sure that we're appropriately using those sources. Um, so we are in the middle of that right now, but we haven't seen any um, any areas to be very concerned at this point. Um, I did want to touch on your question. I really appreciate it about the um, turf removal and potential for rebates. And we have started to study that as part of the drought reserve funds that we put in place last year. We have potentially set aside some dollars there to help incentivize people to take out 
to remove turf. Um, just with the uh, sh with the reductions that we're seeing this year and potential revenue shortfalls, we're just managing how best to use that between maybe revenue we need to use there or the potential for using that um, for a turf removal process in the future. For sure. Summit. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just I'll just add to that. We're we're it's it's we're seeing the same thing. Um, like, like Clint said, it's a constant reminder when you drive by the reservoirs, you know, what's happening on top of the ground is obviously happening underneath the ground. So, you know, it's, it's a little, it takes a lot longer for a, a well to, to recharge the, the ground can go a long ways where in a reservoir, you see it right there. Um, some of our aquifers, you know, go all the way into park city from Jeremy ranch. Um, and, and all through the basin, so they're they're big they're big they're big storage areas. Um, the water doesn't travel through the ground as quickly as it does on an open storage, but but yeah, and and, and when we monitor it, uh, we you know every well has been given an allocation to how many uh, connections or, or gallons per minute can pump without drawing it down, and that's kind of where we set ours at. So even though in the peak peak time of the year we'll see it drop because you're pumping a little harder but it recovers you know throughout the, the the mild part of the year so we always see it come right back up by this time of the year they're all full and ready to roll so yeah and uh i just like i just kind of look at it as you know what you see on the top is kind of what's going down below okay thank you uh the next question comes from our one of our online individuals, and it's from Holly McClure. And she says, thank you so much for taking the time to put this presentation together. It's been extremely informative. My question, what impact does the governor's declared state of emergency have on the agencies presenting today? So I think let's just start with Weber Basin and just quickly work our way down as to how you're addressing that uh, emergency declaration from the governor. Yes, so I think, uh, you know, with the governor uh, jumping on board like that and declaring that, it really helps us with uh, our current drought contingency plan that we have in place, the water restrictions that we currently have in place. Um, we're able to uh, let them know that the, the governor is on board as well. Um, we can't necessarily blame the governor, you know, for uh, the issues that we're currently facing. But he can uh, he can help with us uh, have part of the blame, you know that uh, hey we are in a drought we need to make sure that we're using this water resource properly, and the restrictions that we're seeing uh, we were based and implement are the most serious we've ever implemented for uh, for the water district uh, back in seventy seven I think was the last time we had restrictions more than a twenty percent restriction that was a forty percent. 40% restriction for water use from the Weber River. So a 60% is extremely significant. We wanted to ensure that, you know, we didn't get more restrictive throughout the season. We wanted to start out aggressive and then if possible, relinquish those restrictions. It's so much difficult to go the other direction. So we wanted to ensure that that, that was the case. And so we felt like that that would be the worst case scenario. And then again, we monitored these, these, uh, you know, snowpack, soil moistures are at, current weather conditions on a daily basis, and then we will adjust those restrictions uh, as necessary. But also uh, potential uh, funding is, is something else that, uh, uh, drought funding that it opens it up when the governor declares that state of emergency. So there might be some, some resources there available to us as well. But I think it really points the picture to the public that we are in a drought and we need to make sure that we're being wise with our current water use, so. I think from Park City's perspective, I echo a fair amount of what Darren said there. I think it makes the conversation with our customers easier. And it also just highlights that we're, we're all in this together. So the choices that we make in Park City have an impact downstream on the Wasatch Front. And this is a serious drought that's impacting not only our customers, but agriculture, uh, and, and people throughout the state. So it just makes having that conversation a little easier. I don't know if it makes the conversation any easier because we're, we're accustomed to green yards and everything, but, but yeah, this is not an individual water company problem. This is something that the, the state of Utah 
is facing and we are following Weber's lead on that. <clears throat> and we don't know if next year we're going to be in the same spot or a worse spot. So we're trying to preserve the resource that we have. everyone else said. I would also just add, I appreciate the governor's attention to drawing attention to conservation efforts in the, in the state. Um, I also point out this was a very heavy, heavy bill in the legislative session for water bills. There were 20 to 30 water bills that were, um, and the governor was out at, at um, the Jordell signing. So it's definitely caught the attention of um, the legislative body and hopefully we can help. And we, we are getting movement, I think, with secondary metering. Um, the need for county facilities to have some oversight in their general plan on how they're using water. So I think all those policies just help drive the message that we're trying to promote here at the local agencies. Yeah, I just echo all of that. That's, we're, we're on the same page. So, um, you know, all, all the way into California, everybody in the West is experiencing this. It's not just us, but but we're in this together. So we all need to, to take the governor's lead and, and conserve everywhere we can. Mike, does Snyderville Basin water reclamation have a role in the governor's declaration or um, how might that impact the services that you provide or the services you provide to the environment? It is, as you well know, we are not a water provider, but we do treat water that can be reused. And uh, I think you will see more reuse projects throughout the state of Utah in the very near future. There are two projects underway to uh, put a pilot project in place for direct reuse, meaning highly treated wastewater is treated and then treated again and put directly into the drinking water supply system. Uh, you will see those types of projects in the future. So wastewater uh, has not historically been used to the level that it can be used to help uh, deal with drought situations. Great. Are there, other, are there other questions inside the room here? Yeah, in the back. Here quick, Linda, we're running out of time. My name is Susan Cordon, and I did have a question for Mike, actually. Um, you talked about how um, the pharmaceuticals are getting into the water, and that was pretty devastating to hear. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's public outreach that you all are doing or education. I, I presume there is, but you know, what can the rest of the water agencies in the room potentially do to help that idea well, too? There's one uh, very important item that uh, the citizens can help out with, and that is do not flush your unused medications. Just this past Saturday, uh, Recycle Utah in cooperation with uh, Park City, Summit County, us and others held a household hazardous waste collection day. And uh, the sheriff's office was there to legally take back unused drugs and uh, buckets and buckets and buckets of pills were turned in. And that's a good thing. One thing you need to understand, though, when it comes to the pharmaceuticals and wastewater, about 90% of it, maybe as high as 95% of it, is coming from urine and not people that are flushing pills. Okay. That's a different story then, yeah. isn't it? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We do have another question online, which I think we'll cut it off at this point for online questions. The question is, are the water districts working with local landscape developers to promote xeriscape? So let's go backwards this time and start with Summit and then we'll work to the other end. Uh, yeah, we are in a way, um, like I said, we reached out to the landscapers and kind of informed them of how much water was available, what our restrictions were. And we, we advise, we recommend like, our customers own a certain amount of water, so we really can't force it, but we definitely encourage it. Yep. Mountain Regional is also reaching out to our, our um, HOAs in particular. We're actually meeting with Promontory HOA um, on Thursday, and that's to kind of inform those residents, and they've made some changes in their actual policy on what they're going to allow in those HOAs. So I think it's continuing to have conversations about 
what is um, res being required by HOAs in their park strips in their areas. So I think we need to continue those conversations. We're starting those um, to make sure that we can get that visibility out there and some of these um, practices that we haven't had to implement in the past, but we can now make these kind of part of our, our um, future going forward. One of the planning commissions is also addressing this. Um, the HOAs and other entities right now are bound by some of these landscaping rules. So it sounds like from a governmental standpoint, that's also being uh, changed, which will be helpful. Yeah, and I'd echo what our partners are saying up here. Um, we also have a good working relationship with the property managers in Park City. We find they play a large role in landscaping and what it looks like. Uh, and then the Park City Planning Commission recently had a work session on water-wise landscaping and what, what the community would like to see there. Um, and I believe there'll be some outreach to the Park City community in the near future about uh, what the community desires to see there. So <laughs> Weber Basin has been really concerned uh, for a long time about uh, the amount of turf that's been going in uh, new landscapes. And we've been, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we service about 60 different municipalities and water districts along the Wasatch Front. We wholesale water to them. And so we've been trying to educate and work with our cities um, for quite a while to ensure that we make changes to current um, water ordinances that cities have in place. And it's been difficult, you know, three, four years ago to get cities to open up those ordinances and make changes to them because, you know, frankly, they're concerned whether the public wants to do that whether the attorneys, you know, really want to open that up and, and, and take that on in terms of redrafting. But the last two years and with the drought that we've been involved in, we have gotten a lot of movement on that front. And with the Flip Your Strip program, we've been using pressure from uh, the public and we're only allowing cities or, or residents to, we're only reimbursing them if they flip their strip, if their city is willing to incorporate uh, ordinances that will change future landscapes to require no more than 35% uh, turf in the landscape. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of landscapes going in that are doing more than that, but, but we're trying to have the public put pressure on their cities to ensure that it doesn't make any sense to remove turf over here and just put it on these new landscapes. Um, it just, uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. And so we have to stop the bleeding on the new landscape side to ensure that we don't have tons of turf going in there because you know that's the future. So we have to stop that. And it's so much cheaper to be able to do it uh, you know, when they're putting in a landscape than for you know, others of us to change our landscapes. It's terribly expensive to make changes to your existing landscape. I know we've got you know, a lot of folks interested in Flip Your Strip. But again, we're asking them to put pressure on their cities and then the cities, uh, I mean, we've been beating that door down for the last six, seven years, but it's really the last couple of years. John's been to so many city council planning commission meetings, making changes to all these ordinances moving forward. And that's, that's really what we need to have happen. And to minimize, you know, I don't want to get in trouble with Chanshire Farms and those folks, you know, because, you know, they're not happy with some of the things that, that we are doing, you know, cause I know that does impact. We're not saying no turf. We're just saying minimize the amount of turf going in because Utah can't sustain these kinds of landscapes. Our water supply can't sustain these types of landscapes going in. So we have to stop the bleeding on that edge. And, and that's just one, you know, of many conservation projects that Weber Basin is involved in. But that's one that we've been getting movement uh, and it's, it's been very successful because we have to stop the amount of turf going in on these new landscapes, so. Okay, are there any other questions, Chris? Hi, I'm Chris Robinson. I'm on the Summit County Council. And uh, the council has been, a, has, has been alluded has been reviewing a landscape ordinance for the Snyderville Basin. And uh, I think one area that might be really helpful is to get more input from you all uh, 
in crafting that to make because and even the enforcement of it what i see in many jurisdictions maybe outside the state where the water providers are the gatekeepers of making sure that when they sign a new connection that there is uh some review of the landscape plan and that there uh, are some enforcement and uh so uh i'm i'm not formally asking i'm informally asking and as we uh, we want to try to do something fairly quick but i may be uh, reaching out or asking that others reach out to you to try to help us come up with a simple, practical, and effective landscape ordinance for the basin. I assume that you'd be willing to help. That's the question. Great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, last call. We have time for one more. We'll go with another Chris. A pair of Chris's. Uh, Chris Cherniak, uh, civil environmental engineer. Um, for Mike Lures and the idea of reusing advanced treated wastewater, it's, it's such a known technology used in so many states around the country. It has to be uh, implemented here. Um, but is there a zero sum game at play too with in the sense that when you take a gallon of water and you reuse it in some form to recharge an aquifer or send it to a golf course, are you taking a gallon of water away from those trout in East Canyon Creek? And is, is there a balance that has to be met there too? To, to answer your question, Chris, there is. With reuse, you take it out of the creek one time. If you do not reuse it, you take it out every single time you need a gallon of water, if you, if you follow my thought here. So reuse water can be used over and over and over again. Whereas if you do not have reuse water and the water is coming out of a creek, every drop of water that uh, is, is needed comes out of the creek continuously. Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. With that, I think we'll call it a night on this uh, water symposium. I'd like again to uh, a round of applause for our water companies here. And also a thank you to Emma and Gretchen from Park City for getting this up and running and to Brian Craven from Summit County. A round of applause for them as well as they are the. <laughs> and the water purveyors, the water companies will be around for a little bit as we exit and clean up. So if you have a specific question, feel free to engage them at this point. But thank you for coming out tonight. Drive safely and have a great night.